Right. So as human beings, we've, we've always been drawn to, to try to find order out of chaos, to, to find elusive patterns, or to connect the proverbial dots. Right? And at the end of the day, that's fairly close to what we do while engaging at threat hunting activities. Right? Ultimately, we try to connect the dots that will lead us to evidence of an active threat actor within our environment, OK? But let me tell you, as, as, as daunting as connecting the dots might seem on, on a beautiful night sky like the one I brought here for you, the challenge that we're up to on a day-to-day -day business is way more complex, right? We need help. And that's basically what I'm here uh, for today, right? To try and bring some more help into the field. So before we move on, very quick 101 hunting, because I want to put my finger on one specific aspect that has not been uh, discussed yet, right? So textbook hunting, you select data sources, you throw them into your analytics, whatever those may be. Those will do their magic and will spit out a set of leads. Then you have to qualify those leads, because all leads are not born equal. And then you just triage, all right? And triaging is basically throwing that lead into a false positive bucket, which is going to be fairly large if you're doing threat hunting, or it's either engaging your incident response protocols, right? Now, this is hunting a textbook, right? Straight from a textbook. The truth when you start doing this thing for real is that it looks a bit more like this thing here. And if I'm to be entirely honest with you, it really looks like this, right? It's a bit of a mess, OK? So what's the problem here? The problem is you can't triage all the leads you can generate. And you don't know which of those leads is going to be the one that's going to take you to the attacker, right? So how many leads can you triage? It depends on two things. What's your budget? I don't care if that's people, hours per week. At the end of the day, it's going to be dollars. And your triaging cost per lead. And that is the topic I want to highlight today. And I think as a community, we should be discussing more about that. And the reason I bring this to your attention is because the tool that I'm going to be releasing today as open source and presenting to you right now is going to help you two things. It's going to provide you with some very cool analytics for your hunting exercises, but it's also going to help you to dramatically reduce your triaging cost per lead. No matter where you get the lead from. If you get the lead from App Compact Processor, great. If you get the lead from anywhere else, you can still use this tool to dramatically low that triaging cost per lead. And if you do that, you're going to triage more leads, and you're going to increase your probability of getting to the good one, the one that takes you to the attackers. So. Why another tool, right? Everyone agrees that enterprise-wide execution data is priceless. But to be honest, I haven't really seen a lot of people use this to its fullest potential. Okay? And this is not using it to its fullest potential. This is not efficient. This is not effective. This is barely just scratching the surface of the data that we have there. Okay. There's a million other reasons I don't have time to go into right now as to why I needed a new tool. OK. Um, so let's go straight away and, and see what that looks like. So as any other tool, if you just execute it, it's going to dump uh, basically a help uh, menu with you. And it's going to tell you what it can do. Um, I call these modules. I don't have time to go through each one of these modules. There's a lot of things the tool can do for you. But I've selected a few that I think are going to be of interest uh, for you as a threat hunting uh, and incident response community. Right? The rest, you just have to go and uh, and check them out yourselves. So first things first, you need to get data into the tool. right? Not a big deal. The tool supports a lot of different file formats and sources. It is designed right now specifically to focus on shim cache data and AM cache data, just because I can count on every single one of my customers having that available for me. But the important thing here is, the whole ingestion engine has been designed in such a way that it's trivial for you to uh, build up a new ingestion plugin, 
in a few minutes and load your data no matter you know, what that looks like, right? So let's go and see it in action. What I'm doing here is basically specifying a database I'm going to create. I'm using the load module, and I'm pointing it, in this case, to a zip file. And there it goes. What it's doing now, it's basically looking at what stuff I'm throwing at the tool. Are these new hosts? Are these hosts I've already loaded? Are these new instances? And the concept of instance is important because, for example, if we're talking about shimcache data, right? Shimcache data lives within <coughs> the system hive, and specifically within the control set of the system hive. And you all know that a, that a system hive has at least two, uh, but can have more, control sets. And each one of those represent a different snapshot in time of that information, right? And you're also going to have your current system hive, and at the very least, you're going to have another one sitting in the rag back folder, again, with all its control sets. So all of those are different snapshots in time of this trace of execution data, which is what the tool is going to be feeding on, all right? So it's basically doing its thing. It's figuring out, hey, what data are you trying to feed me? Do I have it? Do I need to load it? And then it's using uh, multi-processing under the hood to use all your available cores to make this in just as fast as possible. And there's a whole technology inside of, it, um, of the tool which is going to dynamically create or reduce the number of processes to maximize throughput of the ingestion while minimizing the impact of your system. At the end of the day, the key point is, you know, in this example here, I am loading Shimcache data for about 3,000 uh, 3, endpoints, and I'm doing so on this MacBook Pro here, and it's running in five minutes. Here, I think it's six, because this was <laughs> recorded on the SIFT uh, VM, but I think that exports only two virtual CPUs. But you get the deal, you get the idea, right? I needed this thing to be fast, to be efficient, to run with me at the speed that we need to run when we're doing an IR or while we're hunting. Um, Right, so we got 1.3 million uh, entry um, execution rows loaded. So the first thing that you want to do, of course, is you want to search for bad things. And that's what the search module is assigned for, right? Now, if you don't provide any um, parameters to the search module, what it's going to do is it's going to fall back to a, a file of known bad regular expressions that the, sh that the uh, tool uh, shipped with, right? And I'm really hoping the community is going to jump up and help us uh, contribute to build up the set of regular expressions that we, uh, we released uh, by default, OK? The other important highlight about the search feature here is that, again, it's using multiprocessing under the hood. So basically, that means you're going to get really, really fast regular expression searchings, uh, searches. And the other key component is it's designed to scale. Huh? Another one of the reasons why I had to, or I decided I needed to build a tool was the day I tried to throw um, 3,000 regular expressions at grep, and grep just died on me. This thing won't die. I've been running with 3,000 regular expressions of this tool for the last year. It's going to take it. It's going to take a while, but it's going to take it. It's not going to crack. It's going to. It's going to. It's going to work. It's going to give you the results it's designed for that. Right. So, um, once you. Finish searching, you get two things. You get a list of results, which is what you're going to triage, and then you're going to get a high-level histogram that is basically showing you, hey, this is the stuff that we found, all right? And you can see here some examples of the kind of things that, by default, are included in this known bad um, file. And I want to I draw your attention to, to one um, specifically uh, here. But anyway, the last one here is basically looking for misplaced SVC hosts. So SVC hosts are the XE running from places where it shouldn't. OK, fairly, fairly interesting thing to be aware of. Um, we're going to go, we're going to find those um, two bad guys. But we're going to find them using a completely different technique, a completely different set of analytics, right? Just as an example of how the tool can help you find evil through very different uh, paths. Moving forwards, and probably into what I think is the most interesting analytics um, the tool has right now. Um, 
This thing includes something that we call, or I call, a temporal execution correlation engine. And what that does is the following. You provide it with a file name of interest. And what the thing is going to do is, it's going to go out through your data set, your 3,000 endpoints in this case, and it's going to look every time that file name executed, and it's going to take note of what executed before or after within a user configurable window of interest. All right. And once that is done, it's going to quantify the temporal execution strength. And the way we do that is using formulas that are very similar to the way um, that we measure gravity, uh, in the sense that as uh, execution distance grows, the, execu the temporal execution strength diminishes exponentially up until a point in which, well, there is no, there is no strength at all. Right? Let me just show you how this works with an example um, for which you can actually predict the results. Right? Now, anyone that's been looking at Chimcache for more than a day or two knows that every time that you run net.exe, net.exe automatically spawns net1.exe. Right? OK, so what I'm doing here is I'm running a t-core on net.exe and uh, using that basically as an example to show you the kind of output that we get and, uh, and how we can interpret that. Right. So <clears throat> what the tool is basically uh, doing here is finding all those executions, as I said before, seeing what was running before and after, and then it's providing me with this list. And this list is sorted by temporal execution correlation strength, right, top to bottom. So it's telling me, hey, there's this file called net.1.exe, which has a very strong temporal execution correlation with your file of interest, which was net.exe. And it's also telling me, hey, this thing executed 1,179 times after net.exe, around 600 times before. And this is a side effect of consecutive executions of net.exe. And it's also giving me the total execution within the whole data set, within the whole 3,000 hosts. So I, I have a ballpark figure of how many times this was executed within my organization. And finally, it's telling me if the bond is bidirectional, all right? So every time it finds a file that has a strong temporal execution with my file of interest, it automatically tries to calculate that same relationship the other way around, all right? And if that is true, you're going to see an inverse bond here. And why is that important? That's important for us because if the file that we're uh, using uh, calculating a t-core is interesting for us. And it has a strong bidirectional relationship with this other file, then this second file is also going to be of interest for us. Because every time this thing runs, this thing also runs, and the other way around. Every time this thing was executed in my environment, this thing was executed in my environment too. So it's an excellent way to pivot through attacker files within your environment using this kind of pivoting technique based on uh, temporal execution correlation strength. Right? Let's move on. Let's see a different analytics. What I'm going to run now is something called the Levin module. And the Levin module uses an algorithm called the Levenstein algorithm, which is an algorithm that, given two strings, calculates the edit distance from string one to the other. So how many changes I need to do to one string to get to the second one. And by default, if we don't provide any other arguments, it's going to do this for everything living within Windows System 32. And it's going to highlight all the small uh, deviations from legitimate file names that have been executed within System 32 across my 3,000 endpoints in this case. Got it? So what do we get? Well, we see one clear bad guy. We see one. SV host, missing the C, that was executed from uh, within uh, Windows System 32 on one of my 3,000 machines. Right? Now what I'm doing is I'm just going to uh, use Levenstein again, but this time I'm specifying svchost.exe. So now I don't care in which folder this thing was run from. I want to see any typos 
around SVC host, no matter which folder they were executed from. And we find another likely bad guy, no? one called SVC host S, plural, with an extra S. OK, so now all we're going to do is we're just going to search for these and see where they executed, what system, what folder. So we start with the SVC host S guy. Of course, all the host names have been redacted here, but by the way, I'm showing you the real stuff. This is not doctor databases. These, is, these are real databases from real investigations, right? We saw this one run, uh, was executed from D, um, um, the D drive. And now we're searching for the other one, svhost.exe. And there you go, we get the host name with the dates, we get everything, and we confirm that this one was indeed executed from within Windows System 32 um, on this uh, specific redacted host name. OK, let's move on. Uh, F-Search is another module that allows you to do searches on specific fields. I'm not going to show it to you because I don't have time. But um, we need this to learn the name of the fields because that what, that's what we need to use the stack uh, module, which is what I'm running right now. So what I'm doing now is I'm telling it, hey, stack file paths for me for every execution of svchost.exe, right? So we found typos around SVC host. Now I want to see where all those correctly spelled SVC hosts run from. And what I see immediately is, hey, there's, you know, there's two very strange places. I have two executions of svchost.exe from the root of the recycle bin. Doesn't look good, right? So let's go ahead and search for them so that we get a bit more of information. We see what systems, we see what timestamps we have. And what we see is basically the fact that the last modification timestamp stored on the Shemcash record for these two is exactly the same, which is another interesting red flag for us. So the last thing that I'm going to do here is I'm going to go back to my T-Core module, my temporal execution correlation module. And I'm going to tell it, hey, I want to see what stuff is related to svchost.exe, but not to any svchost.exe, only to those ones that were executed from the root of the recycle bin. OK, what can you tell me about that? So we run that. And what we get is three files, right? One of these three files is pretty obvious, right? It's telling me, hey, who am I was executed two times before svchost.exe was executed from the root of the recycle bin on two systems within your 3,000 hosts that you're looking at in this database. I don't have time to drive into the other one, into the other two files that present a strong temporal execution correlation here. So you have to take this as an act of faith. One of those was a dropper, and the other one was a credential dumper. Okay. This is the speed at which we can hunt and at which we can triage if we're using the right tools. This is the way it should be done. Right? So I don't have time for, oh, no, I have time for one more demo, sorry. Yeah, so let me show you the databases. This is the database we've been looking at so far. It's around 300 megs, and it only has Shimcash data. Now let me show you a different data set. This one is like 10 gigs, and this one has a combination of both Shimcash and AMcash data for a bigger organization. Uh, this, was, well, this one was 4,300 and something hosts. We got a total of 26 million entries on this database. Um, I don't have time to drive you through the whole analytics. I'm going to take you straight to the meat in this one. These attackers are very noisy. One of the things they did was they just brought Mimikatz into the environment without even renaming it and executed it. And that was the flag, and that got us you know, called in by the customer. So what I'm doing here is I am basically uh, searching for, in this case, for Mimic to see what's up there. And boom. What this thing is telling me is, hey, this thing ran 17 times. <clears throat> Six of those are duplicate hits, so it's going to remove them from, from, um, from my view. And the important thing for me is the fact that 
most of them have been executed from within the Windows config folder, which is odd. So that makes me think, oh, maybe this is the you know, preferred staging folder for this specific attacker. So what I'm doing now is I'm using the stack module again, but the other way around. Now I wanted to stack uh, file names for everything that was executed from within that folder across my 4,200 something hosts. Boom, right? There you go. This doesn't really need a lot of explanation <laughs> to anyone, right? You basically have to go ahead and hit the red button, move your organization into incident response mode, right? By the way, there's no CGI here. These videos have not been uh, sped up at all. This has all been played back in real time. So, more stuff, um, more analytics. Um, time stacking. Time stacking is designed for a slightly different scenario. So instead of pure hunting as we understand it here, time stacking is designed for when you are investigating, you have a clear understanding of what the attackers did and when they were active, but you're not sure if you're missing something, right? Yeah. Maybe the attackers, you know, deviated from the known TTPs just for one host and left it there as a plan B, as a backup in case they were found. Am I really seeing everything they did? Well, what time stacking does is very simple, okay? You provide it with a time frame of activity, non-activity, of your attackers. And what it's gonna do is, it's gonna go and it's gonna find everything that executed within that time frame or nearby that time frame, okay? It's gonna go and it's gonna do the same thing for every single file name that executed outside of the time frame of attacker activity. And then it's gonna do a very simple uh, ratio. It's just gonna calculate number of times that the file name executed within the known attacker time frame divided by the number of times that file name executed outside. And the end result of this is very simple. We just sort it and what this is gonna do, it's going to automatically bubble all the way to the top those files that the attacker brought into the environment and were executed primarily only while the guys were active in our environment. So it's a really good way to make sure that we're not missing anything, right? More stuff, recon scan. Recon scan is another analytics that's included in the tool right now and <coughs> What this thing is gonna do is basically try to identify reconnaissance sessions. So it has a list of all the reconnaissance commands, uh, which are, by the way, you know, used all the time these days with the whole agentless post-exploitation buzzy, trendy uh, situation in which we're in. So it's basically gonna search for each one of those across your whole database. And once it's find them, it's gonna try to it's gonna to try to group them into reconnaissance sessions. So if I find an isolated ping, that's not interested. But if I find a ping followed by a who am I, followed by a DS query, all right, depending on the cohesiveness, so how close they are to one another, this thing is basically going to attribute a weight to that particular reconnaissance session. And tallying all of that up is going to attribute a weight to the reconnaissance scoring for a host. So one of the things I like to do is I like to run this and then I just like to go all the way to the top scorers and see what happened there, right? And well, sometimes I find attackers, sometimes I find Microsoft was running a wolf pack, which has the same kind of effect. Um, but the interesting thing about ReconScan is not really using it uh, on its own. It's the fact that it's a good example of how you can create a module that is really designed to feed other more advanced analytics. And that's find evil, right? Now everyone standing here has said you can't replace the human, right? And I love my job, so I'm gonna say also that you can't replace the human, right? But, but, I'm presenting you here a zero knowledge, context-free evil finder. The only caveat is that it doesn't work all the time yet, but bear with me for a second. What this thing will do is the following. Very simple idea. It'll just go and it'll look at every single reconnaissance session identified by the recon module. It will go ahead and it will look, hey, what files were executed within 
that within those uh, reconnaissance or potential reconnaissance sessions, okay? Once it has all of that, it's just gonna go ahead, perform frequency analysis based on file name, and it's gonna sort that for you. The end result, well, the stuff that has primarily been executed within or nearby things identified as potential reconnaissance sessions are going to bubble up. Very simple idea, extremely powerful, okay? Now, don't go running and try this on every single one of your, of your engagements. It's not yet ready for consumption. But let me tell you, I found evil with this thing on three different, well, actually two. So it's the first one was the one that really inspired me to create the module, so it's sort of a test, really, on two breaches, okay? We're talking about zero knowledge, hit the button, evil finder, okay? So, the whole point of releasing the tool here is basically uh, achieving a set of goals, right? On the one side, contributing to helping people out there improve their hunting skills. We had some great presentation yesterday about hunting on a budget. Well, guys, this is free, you know, so it'll support any budget that you have. Uh, and as I said before, you don't need any crazy hardware to run this thing. You can, I run it on my uh, MacBook Pro, and I've scaled it all the way up to 60,000 nodes so far. So you, you're not gonna need to buy any expensive hardware to do that either. And <clears throat> the other point is, because I would like the community to step up, um, step up and start creating more advanced analytics. We're always pushing to get more data, and more data is good, but there's one thing that's even better than getting more data, is using the data we have in a more intelligent way, and we're not doing enough of that. There's a treasure trove, and this is just one example, all right? There's a treasure trove of information that is just slipping through our fingers because we're not consuming the data in a really intelligent way, okay? Hopefully, by releasing the tool, all the boring uh, work of you know, parsing, integrating, structuring, indexing is done. And now the only thing you have to go is jump into it, you know, type 10 or 20 lines of Python code, and you can you know, test all your crazy shower ideas, as I call them. Right?